Lower Body Anatomy 101. So we're going to try and cover as much of the basics as possible. I will go off on a few tangents here. I'm going to be pulling up a slide deck for you in just a second. Um, but ultimately, the goal, our goal for today, is to get some understanding of the skeletal structure as well as the muscle functions and actions that create movement within that skeletal structure, right? And so it's to give us a framework, the principles and the understanding overall of how the lower body works um, so that we understand how that applies to a client and understand what exercise selection may be best. And so <clears throat> when we are talking about it, the phrase to remember throughout the entire time that you are a trainer or just in general is that principles are few, methods are many. Principles rarely change, methods often do. Right. And so we know that as a principle, if you eat less, the laws of thermodynamics, right? If you eat less and you burn more, you will lose weight. If you eat more, then you move, you will gain weight. You will acquire more calories in your system than you need, then you are going to gain weight. And the inverse, that is the principle. That does not change. Now, the methods may change. You could go on a 12 day fast. You didn't eat anything. So you're going to lose weight. You could go on a keto diet. You could go on any of the diets. You could go on the carnivore diet. You name it. If it is creating a calorie deficit or eating less than you're taking in, then you will lose weight. So the methods are many, but the principle is the same, the law of thermodynamics. And so we need to think that way as far as the human body and as far as our exercise selection as we are going. So just remember, right? Methods are many, principles are few, methods often change, principles rarely do. I know I said it there at that time the first time, but it's all the same in essence. So I'm going to do a little share screen here and I'll be pulling back in and out of that as we go. But here's our, um, oh, there it is. Here is our slide deck that you are seeing, right? <clears throat> so hopefully you can uh, download and print a copy of this. Should be super helpful to take notes on as well. Um, we've got our skeleton here. We're going to circle back to him in just a second. I want to do a recap of some of our language. The more that you understand this, the better you're going to be. So we've got three different modalities that we focus on as personal trainers and coaches, mobility, stability, and strength. So a refresher mobility is just our freedom of movement. So whatever range of motion you have is your body's range of motion. It's your freedom of movement. And that's what we want. We want from certain joints, more than others, to have freedom of movement. Now, we've got stability. It's just our body's ability to resist force, right? So the more stable you are, the more structurally stable you are, right, the more force can be exerted upon you. The less stable you are, the more functional we become in a circumstance the less we can resist force. And so stability is simply that, right? It is the understanding of the eccentric load that we can usually take ourselves under to decelerate, right? It is basically our body's ability to create a pattern to resist force, our body's ability to stop, our body's ability to balance. It's all of those modalities within one. But as simple as it is, stability, like you're just trying to stabilize, you're trying to resist some type of force that is put upon you. And then you have strength, which is the inverse. It's your body's ability, your muscle's ability to exert force. And ultimately the easiest way to kind of look at this is behavior, right? And so this is what muscle function versus muscle action is. And I, I really need you to get this. A muscle's function is simply how muscles behave when we walk and breathe. They are a stabilization, stability aspect, but we need mobility with a lot of those joints to give us freedom of movement. But the function of a muscle, it's just trying to help you create stability. That's what its function typically is. It's trying to help you create the pattern that you're looking for in a stable environment. That's what its behavior is to help us be able to walk and breathe. That's what its function is. Now, what is its action? Its action is to move. It's the behavior of moving muscle from insertion to origin, right? It is the bicep is, is uh, inserting, right? I'll make this simple, no, no anatomy. Bicep is inserting into your forearm because it crosses over a joint and then it originates somewhere up here in the shoulder. Just made this really simple. And it's going to contract. It is going to move from insertion to origins. And by doing that, the contraction, right? The concentric phase of this movement is going to bring my wrist towards my actual shoulder. It's bringing it closer in towards the body. So the same thing, if you were looking at the hamstring, if I'm going to concentrically focus on this position, 
And this exercise, well, that is all I'm doing. I'm bringing my foot up towards my butt, right? So it's the same thing, a bicep and a bicep, basically. It's your hamstring. So I am concentrically moving it towards me. So that's what this action is to, to, to bring on in. But its function is going to be some form of ability to resist force and stabilize the body as we walk and breathe. Okay, so it's crucial to note mobility, stability, and strength and be able to understand those definitions and spit them out pretty rapidly to understand conceptually the principles. I need you to understand the principles, not necessarily all the different methodologies, not the methods. Principles are many, or principles are few, right? And then you need to understand function in action. So I'm beating this into you by repeating it. So hopefully this makes sense, okay? So why is anatomy important? So why is any of this important? Because structure, your structure of your anatomy, your skeletal structure, your muscle structure, that emulates what your skeletal structure has given it will indicate how you function. So somebody with a really, 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 really long femur and a really short torso is going to move the very, very similar but opposite in a lot of ways to someone that's got really short femurs, really tiny legs, and a really long torso, right? If you have somebody that whether they were born this way, whether they had an accident, no matter what it is, if they've got one leg that is really short or they're missing a leg, just think about it. that structure is drastically different. It is going to indicate how they function, how they move through space, how they walk and breathe, which is what the functionality of mu muscles, right? And so we know that it's not that it will dictate its function. So just because somebody has long fevers and a short torso does not mean they cannot squat. It just means that they, how they present that squat, how they move through space is going to be different than someone with different anatomy. So their structure is going to indicate what happens, but it's not going to guaranteed dictate what happens. So it's all got a flex uh, continuum that we, we're kind of looking at. And so once we know that, we know that the function of that body is going to indicate how we train. So we're just trying to put like, oh, A equals B plus C in most circumstances. It's always, it depends. And so because of that, we know that better understanding that we have of anatomy is going to allow us to write better training programs, better programs equal better results. Better results equal happier clients who pay, stay, refer, and continue to give you employment, right? And so that's why it's important for us to just kind of understand what is anatomy. All right, so we're going to go back, go back to our skeleton dude, right? And I say, dude, uh, it could be a female. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later. You may already be like, ah, I can look at it and I can see more than likely what it is. But again, it could be either. There's no way to tell from this actual image. Um, I'll let you you figure out why, why I would say that. Um, <clears throat> so I want you to always be thinking about the fact that methods are many, principles are few. So there's a few principles that I feel like follow the body really, really well. And so I always look at the human body for similarities, right? So I look at it for similarities from skeletal structure. I look at it from similarities from a muscle structure and from a movement structure, okay? So we're only gonna be focused on lower body, but I need you to see this and we need to do this assignment first. All right, so here's where we, hopefully you can see my, um, my mouse on here. I, I honestly don't know as I'm recording this. But let's look, we got the hand, right? So I'm circled here on the right-hand side of this dude that's facing toward me. It would be his left hand since he's mirrored. And then we've got that lower aspect of his forearm, right? No anatomy yet. Then we've got here his upper arm. All right, so let's go down. We've got the foot. Again, five fingers, five toes, right? <laughs> we've got that lower aspect of his leg, you know, basically his shin. And then we've got the upper aspect of his leg. Notice how they're very similar very similar in nature, right? You've got a foot, you've got a hand, very similar. You've got that lower aspect of the leg, lower aspect of the arm, upper aspect of the leg, upper aspect of the arm. And then you have these two joints, ball and socket of the hip, ball and socket of the shoulder. So notice those similarities. Next similarity that I find really helpful, especially as I'm training people and taking into account movement. So then you've got the hip. So hip here, you can see from the front angle, to me, it looks like elephant ears. Some people say that they look like like angel wings. I'm like, I don't know if that angel is ever, angel of death is coming down to me and those are the wings. I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm good. I don't see wings there. But anyways, <clears throat> we're, looking at, we're looking at these pair of wings or uh, elephant ears here. Now, if we look at the backside of uh, Larry here, we're calling him Larry, um, notice the scapula. Scapula is very similar in nature, right? Connects ball and socket, connects ball and socket. Needs to have a lot of movement on the rib cage here and connects to the pelvis and locks in everything down here. 
fascinating, right? In between, we've got this giant spine and then we've got a head and we've got a bunch of other things that are happening. But you notice the similarities. We've got like the pelvis, scat, kind of similar in nature as far as the position, what they're allowed to do, the ball and socket, ball and socket, the uh, upper arm, upper leg, the lower arm, the lower leg, the hand, the foot, right? <clears throat> cool. So we already did a recap of mobility and stability. So when we're looking at joints, when we're looking at joints, we're looking for the same aspect. Now, almost all of your joints need to have both mobility and stability. So anybody that is going to be like, no, Joseph, it needs to have both. I, I get it. But overall, what is its main function? That is what I'm going for here. What is its main function, right? So <clears throat> easiest way to start. Let's start at the bottom. Got this lovely little ankle, okay? Lovely little ankle makes contact with the ground. Well, the foot does, but it needs to go forward. It needs to go backwards. It needs to be able to rotate and go sideways. It needs to pivot. It needs to be able to turn. It needs to be able to bend. It needs to be able to do a lot of things that we were asking of it. It needs to be a pretty mobile joint. If you do not have mobility in your ankle, then it becomes really challenging to walk, to move forward through space. It also becomes really challenging to decelerate, to, to stop movement from happening. And so if you notice, the older somebody tends to get, right, the less they tend to move. Their ankle mobility then goes down. Anybody with an ankle injury, their ankle mobility tends to decrease. The less range of motion and mobility that they have through that ankle to go in all those different planes of motion and to do all the things that we want it to be able to do, the more likely they are to fall. Because if they can't roll through, if they can't step up, if they can't avoid things and pivot with the quickness that they need, shoot, now that ankle can't do what it's meant to do, and now we're going to keep going in motion, if we are already in motion, and fall. And so that's why the ankle needs to be very mobile, all right? So we have a very mobile needed joint. So we need to train mobility back into this ankle and make sure that it's happening. Let's go up the chain, looking at these knees, Right? You get the little patella right here, sitting on top of the femur, connecting to the tibula. This is great, right? Happy little knee joint. What does it need to be? Is it a mobile joint or does it need to be a stable joint? It is a hinge-based joint. It bends the knee. Do we want that knee to rotate like this, right? So you've got your, your, uh, your femur and we've got our fibula. We want it to bend like a door hinge. We do not want the fibula going sideways, right? Tibia shooting off the other way. We do not want to have this happening. Tibia, uh, I don't know why I said fibula earlier. Right the tibia and the uh, femur, we do not want them going sideways. We also don't want them turning, right? It is just a hinge-based joint. So it needs the ability around it to ensure that it's not going in those other directions. And yes, the patella is going to have some play. And yes, you're going to have some ability to laterally deviate within the actual knee joint itself. Some of that is needed. That's why you have a bursa in there. That's why you have meniscus to allow a little bit of flex and not have it pop and hopefully tear the meniscus, not go too far forward, pop and snap the ACL inverse. Yeah. So you get what I'm saying. So ultimately we need it to be a very stable joint. It is a hinge. Go up the chain. All right, so we went ankle, we went knee. What's the main joint above it? Now we've got your hip. We already talked about it being a ball and socket. Ball and socket, oh my gosh. Now we can go all of these directions. It is a very triplanar um, movement-based joint. So it needs to be mobile. So we need to be able to get that joint as much mobility as possible. So we need to train that freedom of movement. All right, cool. Now is where it gets interesting and challenging. Because where do we go from there? What is the next main joint, right? Well, there's, there's lots of different elements that are happening within there. But if we actually come up to where your iliacus, right? So your ilium is your pelvis, your wings here, your elephant ears connects to the spine, right? You have your sacrum down here at the base of your vertebrae and you have your ilium, which makes your pelvis. When those two connect at that joint, it is your SI joint, your sacroiliac joint, okay? Now, your SI joint is pretty easy to find. If you were, take your thumbs and find those two little bony nodules, those are your SI joints. 
Now, oftentimes people are like, oh, my back hurts horrendous. My SI joint is out when it's sitting so much higher than the other. Now your pelvis may be tilted this way to a degree, but your SI joint is one of the most rigid, strongest joints in your body, okay? So it's not going to just magically pop up and out and then be forced down in. We can have anywhere from three to eight degrees of play within this joint, but that is very minimal. It is not much. It is meant to be a very stable joint because right below it, we have the hip, which is meant to be your mobile. Okay, so it is now connecting everything within that base there as that root baseline to lock everything in so that we have all these vertebrae that as we continue to go up the chain, gain more and more mobility. So we have the lumbar aspect, these lower aspect of your vertebrae, which don't have a ton of extension and flexion, right? but they do have some. And then you have your thoracic spine, which is that upper aspect, mid-tier, that has a ton of mobility. It is able to flex, extend, and rotate in so many different ways. And that's where we're to get our rotation. And our SI joints are to be that kind of base facet to lock in and stabilize. And then our hips can go below. So your vertebrae are meant to be mobile, right? Okay. Now we're up here, we've gone up this vertebrae. We have this connection point where everything seems very anchored, right? Now we just had this lower anchor and now we're moving up to this top anchor. Below this lower anchor, yes, we have our sacrum. Yes, we have our coccyx. But above this anchor, yes, we have our cervical spine attached to our crony, uh, cranium, cronium. <laughs> But what is this here? So you've got your sternum, right? And then this little facet here. And then what runs across? Ah, your clavicles. Clavicles, sternum. Sternum, clavicle. Sternal clavicular joint. Boom, boom. Little nodules. Two little nodules. We just saw two little nodules on our back with our SI joints, our ASIS joints, right? If we really want to be specific, anterior superior, right? <clears throat> now... Uh, uh, uh. sternoclavicular joint, really rigid, really, really strong, possibly the strongest in the entire human body. Just like your SI joints, they're a very strong joint. We do not want these moving very much. Body does not want these moving very much. If these move, that means our entire rib cage is probably separated. It means our entire vital organs of our heart and our lungs, not going to be protected. Also means we could have some issues cervical on up. Okay. And so because of the rigidity within this, it is a extremely stable joint. Now, you may have some deviation between each side that can be just based on the fact that 92% of all humans are asymmetrical, all right? So you may be like, oh, I have one shoulder that sits really low, and I have one hip that sits really high, and one leg that's longer than the other. Welcome to being human, all right? We have about 8% of the population that is pretty close to a symmetrical figure. That is great. You know what they get to do? They get to be bodybuilders that present really well on stage without having to focus on trying to change their musculature to imitate where their structure would ideally like to be. The rest of us <clears throat> just get to note that we are slightly off. Even the world's fastest man currently, Usain Bolt, at the time of filming this at least, Noah Lyles is like a phenomenal athlete. We'll see what happens if he breaks the world record. This is January, 2024, we'll see. So <clears throat> ultimately Usain Bolt, he deviates into his right hip because his right side has so much more velocity output, more, more pressure that he's able to exert onto the ground to deliver more force on, from a horizontal vector. And so he basically what that means is he, he shifts into his right hip, and that is a propulsion strategy. That is a strategy his body uses to move forward through space. Would I change that or address that on the world's fastest man? I'd be stupid to do that. I could screw everything up, and probably I would because it is his strategy he is used to become the fastest man on the earth. So 92% of us are going to have these strategies. They become a problem. They become a problem if through repetitiveness, they cause pain. And then they cause 
chronic pain, which is chronic pain is just when we've been uh, experiencing pain for longer than 14 days in a row. Sometimes people think chronic pain is like years. No, you have acute traumatic pain, which is like less than 72 hours, then right around the 72 hour plus, then you have acute pain, then at 14 plus days, I know I'm deviating here, but <clears throat> at 14 plus days, that is, it's considered chronic pain, right? If you're still in pain in some area after that, that is chronic pain and it can be treated differently than something that is acute pain where you may need to immediately refer out um, because it is too fresh and is it, it, whatever the case may be. Um, I always refer out for everything, but you get what I'm saying. So <clears throat> we have that very stable joint here, very stable joint here. 92% of us are going to deviate in some way and have any kind of shifts. So if you're seeing these are off, if you're seeing these are off a little bit, just know that it's normal. It's just like your face, same thing. The 8% of the population that has a symmetrical face, most of them are celebrities because they're like absolutely gorgeous or they're models or whatever the case may be. The rest of us, we don't get that luxury. So we just have to have other qualities, which is what mine is, which is talking a lot and being sarcastic. Enough people seem to like those things. So I go with it. Okay, moving on. Stable joint right? Slide out. Now you're on the shoulder. We took that clavicle for a ride, little sailor, and we got that. It's like our ball and socket that was on our hip. Boom. Mind blown. From very stable, shooting on out. From very stable, shooting on out. Oh, boom. Very mobile. This is great. Go down the chain. Thank you. It's a hinge. I already knew you knew this. You're already moving on. You're like, it's a very, very, very uh, stable joint. And then we need to go here and we need a very mobile joint. Cool. And up here, your neck is again, going up. It's going to be a very mobile based series of joints. And then attaching to the cranium, that better be really stable. Otherwise we're going to have some major issues. Okay. What's the pattern? Mobile, stable, mobile, stable, mobile, stable, mobile, stable. So if we lose mobility in one of these joints that needs mobility, we are going to have the joint above it and or below it trying to create mobility. That becomes a problem. If we have a joint that is mobile when it's supposed to be stable, then it is going to force the joints below and or above it to try and imitate in the opposite pattern. When we develop these patterns of compensation, our body will strategize to still move us through space. It will still try and get done whatever is done, which is why someone in the middle of a war could have a leg blown off and they could still find a way to walk, hobble, climb, crawl to wherever they need to be. <clears throat> it's why three-legged dogs figure out how to walk. They figure out a strategy to move through space. And that's what all our bodies are doing. And so if it's rotated, if it's twisted, if it's bent over, it's hunched over, if something is not mobile when it's supposed to be, it's going to find that pattern, that strategy. That's usually where we develop pain because we are not moving correctly in the right place. And so we are developing a compensation that then just creates pain. So that's why we need to give back mobility where we need mobility, stability where we need stability, and strength where we need strength. <clears throat> so I always ask this question, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Just general question, chicken or the egg? Give me, give me the history lesson, whatever you decide. Cool. All right. So let's look at, yeah, I know. I'm just leaving it at that. <clears throat> Let's look at the knee. Somebody comes in, they've got a knee problem. My name is Janice. Hi, I'm Janice and I've got knee problems, right? I don't know why I have a weird voice. Hi, I'm Janice and I have knee problems. Um, I don't know how it started. I don't know when it started. It just hurts um, when I do everything. Cool, does it hurt when you do this? Yes. Does it hurt when you don't do this? Yes. Does it hurt when you stand? Yes. Does it hurt when you sleep? Yes. All right, so we would have referred out, right? I get that. But Janice is right there in front of us and we're trying to figure something out. Cool. So now we know that the knee is a hinge joint and therefore it needs to be stable stable okay and we see that she's got some deviation within that knee maybe it's valley squats it's collapsing inward anytime she takes a squat right and you're like ah janice we got it got the answer right your knees caving in when you squat so every time you're getting up from the chair right even though you're not working out right now it's causing some problems, which means we could also potentially have some lack of strength within our quads. We've got a great ability to train those and create some extra stability back in that knee joint. Um, and we can also work on some of your hamstring strength so that when you are walking, that knee feels a little bit more stable that way as well. Cool, cool, cool. So now we've addressed around it, but we need to look broader. We've only looked at the knee and we, we looked at the hamstring. I mean, you could even address the calf and build some calf strength, right? Tell her you're going to focus on these things. Like, cool. You never told her she was weak. We don't do that. We don't tell clients they're weak. So we don't tell them that our glutes are lazy. We don't tell them any of these things. We just say, we have some opportunities to build some strength. 
to build some stability, we have opportunities. We are focusing on the positive because we don't know if something is quote unquote turned off because the muscle can't be turned off. You wouldn't be able to walk, stand, sit, like, come on, stop with it. Like your glutes are asleep. It's, it's baloney. That does not exist, right? Because the glutes main function is to keep you, right? Stable, to stabilize the pelvis. We'll get, we'll get into that later, but they can't go to sleep. So therefore we're looking at this knee. We figured out that Janice has it. She's like, oh, that makes sense. Um, and then you're like, all right, let's see how you move through a few different tests, right? <clears throat> so if this is stuck here, and it is trying to create some mobility out of the knee when it was supposed to be stable, we can look up for the hip. And we're like, ah, that's the thing. It's the hip. The hip doesn't have enough mobility. It is rigid and it is internally rotated and it is stuck, right? Potentially, it is a strategy that is using temporarily through certain ranges. You can't say always, ever, right? Just, just be open-minded. And so we're like, it's going to be the hip. You guys work on the hip. Sweet. It still feels like crap. You do all those other muscle things you're going to do. And you're like, I'm the man. I've got this. I'm the best trainer. Like, right? I'm the female champ. Whatever. Male, female, whatever. I don't care. And then you realize, oh, my gosh. I didn't look. I didn't look below. Her ankle is jacked. <laughs> poor Janice. She's like, my ankle is jacked. I forgot to tell you. So poor Janice's ankle doesn't have the mobility that it needs. It is a mobile joint. You've been focused on building all the musculature around the the knee that stabilizes the knee, which is great. And you worked on her hip mobility, it was great. But her foot was collapsing every time she was stepping. And so then it was causing all the knee pain. You're like, ah, right? And you work on her ankle and you're like, oh my gosh, it went away. But what if it was the inverse? You work on the ankle and it was actually the hip. Is it the chicken or the egg? <laughs> which came first? It doesn't matter. You have both. You got a hip, you got an ankle. I don't care what is causing the knee pain. I'm going to look for where I have an opportunity to create mobility that the body might not have. I'm going to look for areas of where I can create stability in the body parts that I realize she might not have that area of stability. Okay. So we're just looking for mobility and stability within each kind of joint and seeing if it's functioning as it was initially intended to, or if it is taking over the pattern of something else because of a compensation. And so I want you to treat individual aspects of the body on both a micro and a macro scale. Think of it like a movie. We are going to get into anatomy eventually, <laughs> but think of it like a movie. With almost every opening scene of a movie, right? Let's look at a Western movie, all right? So we're chilling out in Montana, right? I know it's like North, but that's, I just had watched the Yellowstone episode recently. So <clears throat> chilling out in Montana and they open up this movie scene, right? And it's just a close up, classic cowboy. His name's Bucky. I don't know, I just made that up. So he's wearing his cowboy hat, right? And you just see from here to here and it looks like he's on a horse, but you can't tell. You are close up, right? What's the next scene that they do automatically with every movie and every opener? Now, so you just went from zoomed in. You've got a character. You've got something that drew your attention. You've got something to focus on. And now, boom, we go global. So now we go really wide. And you see this tiny little guy on a tiny little horse. Like you see, and you, you assume it's Bucky. And they're just trotting along. And you just see these giant mountain landscapes. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And now you've got frame of where they are in space. So you had like this image of like Bucky from here to here and you're like, boom, ah, got it. Cowboy, Bucky on a horse somewhere with mountains in a in farm country, something. I'm starting to put pieces together. I got the micro, I got the macro. The next scene, it goes in halfway. And now you're zoomed in a little bit more and you can tell it is Bucky and he's on a horse. And now you go in a little bit closer, right? So now you can not only tell that it's Bucky and he's on a horse, but you got it's Bucky, it's he's on a horse and he's carrying something special in this hand and he's riding the horse with one hand. You couldn't see that from the initial shot. You couldn't see that from the big shot. You started to now get a frame from the middle shot and then you dived in to the second middle shot. That's how every single scene will go. Watch, do it. Like watch the movie, that's how it does. Same thing from the human body. We are gonna do that from a coaching perspective with every type of coaching we do. We are gonna go from the micro, ah, you're telling me it is your knee. Cool. Now we look at the macro. Let's look at this entire body. How is this person like standing? How are they sitting? How do they come in? What are they doing? How are they presenting and orienting themselves in space? Right? Now we're going to work our way down. Uh, what are the hips doing? Uh, what is the thoracic spine doing? Right? We're going to start to chunk back down. And then we pull back out. And then we try to chunk back down. The same thing applies when you're coaching a class or a client. You're going to dive in. You're going to be like, yes. I want your knee to shift out a little bit, push in here, push in here. Yes, awesome. Then you pull out. All right, guys, you guys got this. We're doing a great job here. We're on to our next movement. Sweet. All right, Becky, how are we feeling over here? 
Cool. James, how's that knee feeling? Cool. All right, Sandy, now they really push that knee up. You are literally doing this movie framework in everything that you do, whether it's an assessment, whether it is coaching a class, whether it's coaching one on one, whether it's looking at the individual human body. And that's how we can get into determine stability, mobility, stability, mobility, stacking joints. That's what the body does really well is stack joints. <laughs> We've been going for a long time, and now we're finally going to get into anatomy, right? <clears throat> All right, so we're just going to look at individual things. So let's look at the ankle joint. It's just really where like your shin and your calf basically all meet, right? You don't need to really know tibia, talus, and fibula. If you want to learn all the anatomy, go for it. Cool. But we just need to understand that that joint itself, right? That specific joint, right? The talus uh, tibia joint, right? It is designed to move through plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, which just means plantar flexion is where you point your toes away. So think standing calf raise, you point your toes away and you elevate, so you activate your calf. You pull them towards you and you activate your shin, your anterior to the outlets, right? And so that is going to pull you back into place. One is almost a decelerator. One is a accelerator. One is to help you with propulsion moving forward, right? The other is deceleration, pulling you back, slowing you down. So we need both aspects, but it is really just a hinge-based joint within there. Now, the rest of the foot, 26 bones, designed to do all of the other planes of movement. We do need the foot to actually be able to roll. We need it to be able to actually um, interiorly rotate so that it is going through a form of uh, pronation so that we can kick off and so that when we kick off, it can actually go through some abduction, abduction, and then kick back up underneath us and go into external rotation of the hip, right? <clears throat> um, but it is important to note that it's still just a hinge base. And so we need to maintain that ability to hinge through that dorsal flexion, plantar flexion aspect of the talus, because without it, we are going to have to shuffle, right? And so it is important to note that three planes of motion, you've got your sagittal plane, right? You've got your frontal plane, you've got your transverse plane. So your sagittal plane is where you're going to squat. It's where you're going to deadlift. Both feet are usually planted and you're moving in that up and down position. It's all based up for, for forward and backwards type focus, right? When you squat, you slightly go forward, your butt like comes back and you hinge, it's just more so, but it is in the sagittal plane. Then you have the frontal plane where things are shifting, moving side to side. So now you're in your gait cycle, right? I am moving forward when I walk. And when I walk forward, ultimately I'm moving in the sagittal plane, but I'm going to be really sassy, right? When I move my hips way more than you would ever probably want to see, way more than I want to see. I hope you, I hope you erase that from your memory. Um, but you, you ultimately are moving your hips in the frontal plane, back to back to back, right? Then, oh my gosh. Now I am moving in the transverse plane. I am going through rotation or anti-rotation of space. So back to the ankle. With the ankle, right? If I cannot move my ankle by rolling it, what happens? Well, then to turn, I literally have to turn in a sagittal type position of my body. I cannot rotate to pivot, right? To be able to go through. Once I have lost my transverse plane as I have aged, because I haven't trained it, I haven't worked on rotation and anti-rotation, oh my gosh, now I have to turn like this. That is not a good sign. That means if I need to turn and I catch my foot on something, I am going to fall in and probably break a hip and probably die within a year and a half statistically. Statistically one in three over the age of 65 will die if they break a hip. So I need to be able to maintain my body's ability to rotate. I need to maintain my body's ability to move within the frontal plane, even with walking forward, which means I need to maintain my ankle mobility to be able to roll my foot through ground contact so I don't catch my toe on something. Now, the moment I stop training, stop working out, stop getting strong, I am going to lose ankle mobility because I am not doing anything that is creating that ankle mobility. I'm not doing anything that is forcing plantar and dorsiflexion, right? So I'm not doing anything that is creating enough need to move fast enough, to flex enough that creates enough propulsion that requires me to also create the ability to decelerate and to stop, right? Which means I run into a problem really quickly if I don't have quick reaction. How do you train quick reaction? You just have great fast twitch muscle fibers. You got fast twitch and you got slow twitch. Two different types of slow twitch. It's not important. 
you, you need to train power. Your body's quickness, reactivity is trained by training power-based moves. Power-based moves are going to be slams, jumps, right? Hurdles. They're going to be cleans, jerks, snatches, anything that is really explosive in nature that doesn't exert a lot of ATP, right? So it doesn't exert your body's uh, fatigue centers. It, it's generating a lot, a force which equals a lot of velocity within some capacity. Even just slamming a ball is a form of power training that can be really beneficial, especially for our older population. We often talk, times talk about power training just being for our athletes, right? But every adult, everyone who's still existing, in my opinion, is an athlete. And so what I want you to think of, if I just quick step, move my foot forward, sorry, I'm back up and down here, not the greatest screen. But if I just learn to quickly take a step, I am learning power. I mean, explosive through my hip, and then I am treating training the deceleration. Well, what is this? explode, right? And then I'm creating deceleration by catching in this position. I don't want it to keep going, right? I don't want to catch here. And then, yes, I could catch into a deep squat, right? But I need to decelerate. So part of power training is the art of deceleration, right? You do a box jump, you do a broad jump. You need to train that ability to absorb force into that box or that broad jump so that you don't just let muscles and joints keep going and then you blow things out. It's why most often deceleration is trained for young athletes or explosive based athletes before, right? So you jump off of a, you step off of a box and you learn how to absorb force. You learn how to uh, decelerate before you learn how to exert force. So you're learning ah, boom, 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 stability, mobility, stability, ability to resist force, front ability to exert force. So you're learning that first, but for our older population, shoot, if we don't have the ability to quick step and absorb that force and decelerate, we're gonna run into problems where then they can't move that leg quick enough, they don't have that explosive power, then they're just gonna trip and fall. So this is why the ankle joint is so important, okay? Common issues, center of gravity, center of gravity. So your center of gravity is going to dictate where your body lives, obviously in space, and how it reacts to its external environment. If your center of gravity, because of your job, your life, your stress, puts you on the Michael Jackson track, right? And your body has this center of gravity that is so far forward, oof, now our body's going to want to continue to move forward. So our gastroc and our plantar fascia is gonna be all kind of pissed. This is why so many people have issues with plantar fasciitis. Look at the position of their body. If we go back, to our little ankle man here, ankle man, bone man, what we were looking for from a center of gravity standpoint, if we had him switched to the side, we would be able to see if his ankle is right underneath his knee, is right underneath his hip, is right in line with his uh, actual shoulder, is in line with his ear. And so what I mean by that, if I look at somebody from the side, it tells me a lot that their ankle, right, this malleolus, this big old bump here on the side is in line with my knee. I know that, well, at least that's kind of creating a center of gravity. But if all of a sudden I'm like here, and I draw a straight line up, wow, look at how my body is compensating. Look how my body is trying to find a unique pattern to express itself within space. So if that body is like this, <laughs> I better try and get it to come back here. And so if it's like this, I know that I don't have very much range of motion left in those ankles because when I go down to squat, it's already gonna be forward. So I may need to have a strategy to be able to get me back into that position that is gonna move better. Right? And so this is why we see so many people with that, with plantar fasciitis issues or bunions, because they're so far forward within that position that they actually rotate in, right? And push off of that inside of that big toe, creating that friction constantly. So that big toe ends up boop, turned in. You ever see that? Somebody's big toe turns in, maybe yours, I don't know. But ultimately they, they're the ones that end up with bunions. And they need to get that, that removed. It's just the calcification of extra bone that grows from constant contact with the ground. Or they end up with plantar fascia issues because the plantar fascia attaches to the calcaneus, which is the back of the foot, which attaches all the way up and through, through the calcaneal tendon, AKA your Achilles tendon, but it's called the calcaneal tendon if you want to be specific. And then it attaches into your gastroc. So we know, oh, wait, if we actually train some calves, some soleus, shift the body back, we might actually solve some of this plantar fasciitis that's going around everywhere all the time, right? Because we have weakness of the foot and we have weakness from overly stretched calves. Um, and that uh, 
shin is just so weak. And so we want to pull up into plantar flexion. We want to train that, right? So we want to train the tibia. <clears throat> I mean, the anterior tibialis. All right, so let's look at the gastro. So we know what the structure of the foot kind of looks like. We know what the tibia looks like. So we got these uh, two big portions, the gastroc. That's just those big meaty parts on the outside, the, the, the very part that you see. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting because usually the people that jump the highest and run the fastest uh, don't have these massive, massive calves, right? And it's because like that tendon, that Achilles tendon, it's your spring, right? So your, your calf is how you're going to use as far as propulsion, right? But that tighter that Achilles is, so somebody with a very long aspect of their, their, their shin, their tibia, um, it's probably gonna have a longer Achilles. So their calf is probably gonna be a little flatter and closer to the actual uh, fibula, but overall it is going to be able to generate more force because it's gonna be able to get tighter and then spring even more, right? Whereas someone really the calves, they're just lucky because they look phenomenal. You lucky, lucky people. I have very tiny calves. So screw all of you with the gorgeous calves. But <clears throat> what does it do, right? It extends the knee or it flexes the knee and it plantar flexes the actual foot. So it helps us be able to lift off. It helps us with propulsion to move forward as far as muscle function. But you also have the soleus, which is like closer and in, which has a lot more to do with, again, function. So it has a lot more to do with the deceleration because it's going to stabilize us through. And you can see here, it comes all the way up. Almost all your muscles do come up and connect to a joint that is above or below. That is how they were able to concentrically flex said joint. That is how they are able to make things bend because it has to be on the other side. It is literally a door hinge has to be attached to a wall and a door. You, you got the door in between. That's great. But ultimately it has to be attached on both sides to make it hinge. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. All right. So <clears throat> again, um, you've got the origin, right? It originates from the, the condyloid of the femur and then attaches down here into the Achilles tendon, AKA your calcaneal tendon. Um, whoops. And, and then one thing to kind of note is sometimes the bigger the calves, right? <clears throat> the more back pain somebody tends to have. And the reason being, the reason being somebody with a really good, massive set of calves who doesn't train them. And they're just like, Oh, I'll just learn this way. Right. Their body probably presents itself with a, um, slightly more anteriorly tilted pelvis, right? And then you do not have anterior pelvic tilt. It's not something you own. You didn't buy it, but you can be in it. And that is also a good thing in a lot of circumstances, especially with your body's ability to run and to jump. It is required, okay? This is for a little bit later. But ultimately, their pelvis is tilted forward, right? Oftentimes, this is the type of person, a massive set of calves, they're using their calves as their hip flexors. They're pushing off, or hip extenders, I'm sorry. They're pushing off of their foot so much and using so much calf that's why their calves have grown so much that they have a really flat butt they don't have a butt right they don't have an ability to extend their hip the way that their butt is supposed to extend their hip they're using their calves as their butt and so therefore they usually like present with a really big open chest think your bodybuilder right uh not your bodybuilder i'm sorry your power lifter that comes in they're externally rotated with the feet right and they live in hyper extension and they're like really proud chest like, what up bro my name is brad be rad all I do is power lift, right? So B Rad power lifter comes in. He's like, lives in this position. He's usually got a slightly flatter butt than he needs. And he's usually got a pair of quads, uh, calves that are doing the extension of his hip. So it's just interesting to kind of note, see how that translates on up. They usually live in a lot of lordosis of that lumbar spine. And, so, and usually a power lifter still has <laughs> awesome glutes. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, it's that person who mirrors that body who probably doesn't train doesn't work out. So it's just something to note like, oh, wow, what are these calves doing, right? Um, if, 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 and it will happen quite often, you have a client that is like, I'm feeling too much my calves on hamstring work. Well, let's think, what do the calves do? Plantar flex. Oh, so, you know, we come up onto the toes, we lift our body up, that is using our calves. So how about we don't do that when we're doing hamstring work? How about we dorsiflex? So we're turning off the calf. So we're just using the calf now to insert up into, right? Where does it go? Ah, yeah, Achilles. And where does it start? Ah, the condyloid of the condyle of the femur. So if it attaches up into your femur, now it is just stabilizing the knee. It is stabilizing the ability for you to use your hamstring. Perfect. So dorsiflex, pull your toes back. You use less 
from your calf. This is what we want, right? Train with your knees straight. So think of standing is gonna hit more gastroc. Training with your knees bent typically works a little bit more soleus. And just think about the way that that insertion comes here versus the gastroc insertion comes all the way up here, all right? All right, so we're moving on up. Knee joint, it's a long lesson across the board, but this is needed. This is why this is the upper and lower anatomy separated. Knee joint, you got the type. It is a condyloid type, right? So it comes over, comes over. You got this beautiful patella, sits in the top, and then it runs straight on down into that big ass uh, tibia that is there. You can see the crisscross pattern that is happening on the inside. Um, and then you've got all these wonderful little pieces. We're not gonna go super deep into different aspects. You just know if you deviate left or right, run into some some issues with some meniscus and or any type of too much rotation and you uh you go too far too fast too far forward and that tibia continues to move forward um th if this keeps moving forward then we know we're, we're tearing an acl which is, is what's most common right so a ton of issues can happen with the knee it's just a, a hinge right this flexion extension it does do some internal and external rotation it is just that it's subtle but it has the ability to do so which is is brilliant because if you're running a really long distance and you have some deviation within your hip or some collapse of your ankle, again, could be either or, we just know that it needs to have some, right? So it is just stuck in the middle of these other two joints that has happened. You are a long distance runner and your knees are constantly caving in and you're like, I'm experiencing knee issues. Chicken or the egg, it could be the hip, it could be the ankle. They're gonna just probably at a running store, watch your running store, running store, watch your gait cycle, which means how you run, right? Watch for compensational patterns. So if they're seeing like some valgus collapse, seeing your feet pronate and then your knees capitulate in, that issue could be coming from your hips. It could, it could be in your inability, right? Your inability to stabilize your pelvis, which could potentially, notice it's always these could, 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 we don't know really know, but could be because our glute med and glute max are not doing as much as we need to. We need to build up that extra strength so that they can actually stabilize the hip a little bit more than what it's going through. And that hinge can just do what it's meant to do, which is to go forward, right? But they'll just put you in a pair of stability shoes, which is the big post on the inside of the shoe and it avoids the foot's ability to collapse and pronate inward as much. And so then the knees don't go and then the body feels great. And does that really fix anything? Yeah, it, it totally does. It allows you to run that marathon fairly pain-free, keep moving and getting stronger. So you train the other aspects, could solve the problem. It may not be the actual root of the problem, but it doesn't really necessarily matter. Now, if it still continues to present itself or causes some other issues later on, yes, that is a problem, right? So first, coffee sip. I know I'm talking so slow, you, you know I needed more coffee. <clears throat> but anyways, we got some insights from us, right? The knee position, a lot of times is just dictated by the pelvis. Right? So the position of the pelvis is going to dictate the position of the knee. If we have, and imagine this is my pelvis. So this is my iliacus at the top, the ilium of the actual pelvis. These are my wings, my ears, right? And this is at the base or the front side of my uh, pelvis, right? So if I am internally rotated, well, the backside does this, right? So then because I'm internally rotated, my knee is going to come this way. It's going to come in, right? Um, and so because my knee is going to come in, then my tibia is going to have to offset. So it's going to want to rotate and go out. So then my foot's going to want to pronate when it's going out, but it's also going to evert, right? So basically I end up with that kind of duck foot position, my closed knees, duck position um, that is happening because of the pelvis. And imagine you take one side and twist, you take another side, like there's so many different things can happen. And so a lot of times the position of the knee is going to be dictated by the position of the pelvis, right? What matters to us for limited pain, for greater movement, for our body's ability to produce and exert the maximum amount of force. All three of those things. We want the alignment of the femur and the tibia, right? So you got your femur, thigh bone. You got your tibia, shin bone. I don't know why you have to say those that way, but you just do. Um, and you just have this patella that is sitting on top that's just really protecting the whole thing. <clears throat> but we want to look and see that there is continuity and it is straight as possible. Usually the easiest way to do so, it's pretty rare that somebody's patella is like sideways. You, you do have deviation of the patella. It should be able to move there. Too much is problematic. Um, but ultimately, if we look and put our fingers right on the sides of the patella, pretty easy to do, right? Leg is straight. You're standing or you are uh, seated with your leg straight out in front of you without tensing your quad. That is the key. Relaxed, right? Then we've got our tibia. This little bony nodule right here is called your tibial tuberosity. So that's what this is here. Tuberosity over here on the side. Tibial tuberosity. 
you can feel that pretty easily. So you can put your fingers on top of your patella. I don't know if you can see me from here because I'm in black. And then you can put your fingers on top of your tuberosity and you can slide on up and you can see where that alignment is. So imagine my patella is right, right here. I'm grabbing it. And I grab that little tuberosity. If it's like wherever here, that's probably because this is shifted this way and this is rotated this way. And that's probably dictated by the pelvis. And if we get the pelvis back here, we're probably gonna be okay. But if we had this like too far off, then we know like it's twerking somewhere in there and we're having some problems. So that's where we may want to be careful and we may want to refer out more than anything else. So it's a good thing to be able to note, be able to check um, with, with a lot of clients. And if we just need to then slow it down and build up some stability before we put a bunch of load on somebody, it can be really good. Or we can see if by just messing with the position of the actual femurs, which is really just the position of the pelvis, can we get that to not have a problem? And that's really all you're going to do is you're going to test and track. Test with that client. How does this feel? How does it feel? Let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try which feels best. Cool. All right. Um, the last thing to note about the knee joint, it is happiest when there is a balance between the quad and the hamstrings, right? Most people have stronger quads than they have hamstrings. That's why they end up with more uh, issues that are happening from there. And so it's just good to note. So let's go into those wonderful quads. Beautiful, beautiful quads. I love quads, right? Everybody loves quads, right? You can see here that for the most part, you've got the, the, the three mains that are underneath everything. Um, and uh, just for simplicity, you've got vastus lateralis. So on the lateral side, right? And then you've got vastus medialis. That's that teardrop one on the inside that looks super good with those people that are lucky to have those genetics that be able to do that or they're lean enough. <laughs> well, let's be honest there. That's really what it is. Um, and then underneath, you just can't see it, right? But you've got vastus uh, intermedius, which is just the intermediate one that's in between. And then right on this top, You've got the one that everybody loves, rec fam, rectus femoris, right? So you get your femur, femoris, femur, femoris, right? Um, and you've got your your rec, uh, rec, your rectus. So notice all three of your other ones attached to the outside of the actual femur, right? This is this is important to note, okay? So. You've got uh, the anterior medial, anterior lateral, and anterior surface of the femur, right? So they're attaching basically right along the actual part of your femur. And then they insert into your tibial tuberosity. So we just talked about your tibial tuberosity, right? So you hear your patella tendon. So that's kind of important to note. They all go into that same kind of spot because their main job is to simply flex the hip, right? And extend the knee. So you think knee extension, my leg, like, kicks out, right? That's what his job is. It's contracting. So it then pulls over because they connect on that tibial um, patella tendon, right? That tibial tuberosity. And then you think about it, it helps you get all the way up in a squat because it is helping you extend the hip. Now, which one does that? The only one that's attached to the hip, which is your rect fem. It's the only one doing it from that side. And you can see where it attaches up there into that part of the pelvis. So it comes all the way up. So that's just good to note. And so because of that, right, the orientation of our pelvis doesn't necessarily do a major, major role with how we train our quads because we have these aspects down here doing so much work. So so often people are like, oh, move your legs this way, move your legs this way, move your legs this way to train more of this, to train more of that. Your quads are going to get hit no matter what. Like they are going to engage. Sure, there might be micro differences, but ultimately like you are going to still train your quads quite a lot with every variation of a squat. It's just that it's going to be on a continuum just like with many other things. But because you have your three mains that just literally attach along the actual femur and only one that attaches up above into the hip, you're gonna, you're gonna hit your quads, right? Now, fully lengthened, really fully shortened positions of training, let's save that for a different day, right? But ultimately training insights, overloading just equals poor position. So you, you fry them, you just need to pull off, right? Um, and it's important to note extra, uh, eccentric control right? Like we want to make sure that we have eccentric control when we're training our quads because of the fact that they mainly attach along that actual femur. Okay. So wait, let's go into hamstrings, backside, beautiful side. Uh, not the greatest image here. So I do apologize for that. <clears throat> um, but the, the reason is because you, when you have your hamstrings, you got your three main pieces of your hamstrings, right? Quads have four, hamstrings have three right? They all attach right here, right? So right along the base, let me see. Yeah, good. Ah, there we go. Um, 
Yeah, so you can, it attaches right here to the base of your ischium, right? So the these giant like U's down here. So imagine this is the front side of the pelvis, but imagine if we were looking at the back side of the pelvis, that's where they all attach. It's been a while since I built these slides out. I couldn't remember where that image was. Um, but they all come up and attach the exact same part, right? Which is why they are a hip extender. They are a knee flexor, okay? So their main function is simply to extend the hip. So you're hinged over and you literally extend on up. They contract when you're hinged over, right? So then from here, as they contract, it brings your hip into extension as you're going. Or if you're seated and they're down up here and you're on an imaginary, on my beautiful imaginary leg um, hamstring curl machine, I am going to pull down. So it's going to flex my knee. Okay, so that's its main action. That's what it's designed to do. But what is its main function? The main function is super important. So we just talked about where it originated up there in the pelvis, right on the ischium. Its job is to stabilize the pelvis. Like that's number one, because it's, it's pulling from that aspect. So if our pelvis is tilted too much, we might not be able to get into a good hamstring position. We may not be able to feel our hamstrings in position. They may not be able to stabilize our pelvis. So if our hamstrings are weak when we hinge over and their main job is to be able to, if we're in this hinge position to do a bent over row and our hamstrings aren't strong enough to create stability, our body's ability to uh, resist force, the force being gravity to pull us down in, those dumbbells are just pulling us even more. Yeah, we're going to feel it in our lower back. So we need to be able to train those, those, those hamstrings to be able to know how to function to stabilize the pelvis. The other main thing, okay? So we're talking about its uh, origin up here in the uh, ischial tuberosity, in the ischium, but it's insertion. They have all kinds of insertions. So you see how like surrounds the heck out of that knee from the backside? Super important because that's its main job from that aspect is deceleration of the knee. So you, you, you're running, right? and you need to come to a stop. It's your hamstring's job. Primarily, it's your hamstring's job, okay? If your hamstrings aren't strong enough to do said job, one of them pops or your ACL pops. Your ACL is the backup to your hamstrings that is trying to keep all of that together and it's gonna go. Does that make sense? So ultimately, we need to train those hamstrings to be able to know how to decelerate. It's a huge influencer of the alignment that is happening with the knee because you see how many pieces are attaching all the way around, outside, inside, whoops, and, and uh, medial side. And so it's super important. So if we cannot stabilize our pelvis, we're gonna struggle to train our hamstrings because we're gonna be, our pelvis is now gonna be unstable. You can't train your hamstrings. So we, we need to also be aware of what's happening around the pelvis so we can train those so that we can and get into training our hamstrings. So often people don't feel their hamstrings with a hinge or with an RDL and they just feel their lower back. And it's because their pelvis can't be stabilized. We need to train whatever tra stabilizes the pelvis when the hamstrings aren't doing that. When they are functioning, right, then they, can, then they can stabilize the pelvis. But if you're trying to use the action of the hamstrings to extend the hip, like an RDL, well then you better have something else ready to function to stabilize the actual pelvis. This is where we need things like the psoas. This is where we need things like your lats, just for queuing you up for the next one, okay? <clears throat> so tight hamstrings, often people say they have tight hamstrings. It usually doesn't exist. It's just the fact that they're kind of living. Their pelvis is currently in anterior pelvic tilt when you dump forward with your pelvis, right? If I'm like, hey, I'm a big booty. I'm big booty. Looks good, right? I'm all this lower doses here. Well, it's hiked up. So now my hamstrings feel tight because they're fully lengthened. And so because they're fully lengthened, because my pelvic position, I feel like I need to stretch them. I can't raise my leg. But if I could just get my pelvis to go back to a much more of a neutral position, I'd probably be able to feel fine, be able to train my hamstrings. Just keynote, okay? All right, so moving up a little bit, just to understand a little bit more of the pelvic and the hip structure of the joint. Um, the actual hip is like the entire ilium, right? So you have the iliac crest. Um, it attaches obviously to the, the sacrum, your SI joints on the backside there. You got your, your, your sacrum that is right here, your coccyx that's at the very base. If anybody says they broke their tailbone, that's what they're talking about. They landed on that. Um, and then, uh, then basically you've got your acetabulum, which is where the insertion is that the femoral head goes into from your femur, right? So 
Uh, let me let me slow this down. Um, so oftentimes people think talk about they have an FAI, a femoral acetabular impingement. Femur looks kind of like my fist. This is the ball. This is the neck, right? You've got a big bony nodule on one side, right? So if you're looking, I don't know, it's mirrored here. Um, but but basically like this would be the uh, greater trochanter, which is this ball that sticks out here, right? So I'm right here. Let me do this side actually. So this is my ball. This is my greater trochanter, this bony nodule. You can feel it on the outside of your hip if you just stood up. Stand up and feel that bony nodule. That's your greater trochanter. Kind of important to note uh, as far as a, a structural piece. And then we've got like a, a lump here. Maybe it's like this knuckle. And it's like down here. I can't, can't, can't make it with my hand. Imagine I have a little, little nodule here. That's the lesser trochanter, which is that little bump there. Okay. Astabulum. Moves everywhere. All is good. Some people who need hip replacements, who have an impingement, it is where an aspect of it is not playing nice. It is rubbing, it is not twisting, it is not doing what we want it to be doing. And so you have the fem femur, femoral, astabular, impingement, FAI, right? So it's just something really important to kind of note. Um, <clears throat> and so that ball and socket needs a lot of mobility because it's a mobile joint to be able to move and function, which is why all the motions of the hip include flexion, extension, abduction, uh, abduction, adduction, internal and external rotation. It should be able to do all of those things really well, okay? Um, and that greater trochanter, let's, let's now go into the, the pieces. See this guy out here on the outside? That's that, that thumb, right? Your glute max, uh, your glute med, your glute min, piriformis, IT, TFL, they all come down off your butt backside and connect in there for the most part. So that's like the main piece. And that's how it's able to pull your hip into abduction, external rotation, and all of those wonderful pieces. Now you have your psoas that is one of your hip flexors. You have, we'll actually, we'll get into hip flexors in just a second. But that attaches to the inside, inside of that lesser trochanter and shoots all the way up. So just kind of note, it kind of angles and holds both sides of the hip. So it can do all those wonderful things, right? Pelvis, uh, pelvic tilt and rotation, we've talked about that, but it, it does determine a lot of positions here. And then we have the squat to hinge continuum. So the, the hips really, as far as the bony skeletal structure, is going to indicate our function. So again, if we have somebody with a really deep femoral acetabular connection point, right, they can go really far in one thing or another. Somebody has a really shallow one, they may not be able to go as far, right? So that's going to determine how much range of motion they have from their hips. I can't change that structure, right? If somebody has really long femurs, really short torso, yeah, they probably are on the continuum where they deadlift really well. They probably struggle with squats, long femurs. Oh, you can't squat. Your knees are going to go so far over your toes that you're just gonna run out of range of motion, you're not gonna be able to get very far. Uh, totally makes sense now, right? But that doesn't mean that it dictates function. It doesn't mean you cannot squat. It just means we have to find a compensational pattern that is safe and that works best for us to strategize to move through those horizontal and vertical vectors, to be able to move weight through space in the direction that we want to go. That's what that means, okay? So when we look at that squat to hinge continuum, now we understand that based on our skeletal structure, it's gonna indicate how we function, we can see all the way over here where we've got a machine that is going to keep us very vertical. It's gonna be like a hack squat machine. Hack squat machine, I'm still squatting. My, st my spine is completely stable because I'm on a machine. So now I don't have to learn to stabilize my pelvis. This can be great initially, right? Because I don't have to have that function. And my hips can just come all the way up and push me all the way back down and I can be very vertical with my torso to squat. Now from there, I'm going to then go probably into more of a front squat. And it'd probably even be like a counterbalance squat. So if I'm holding a weight out front, I'm gonna stay very upright and vertical with my torso. Now I'm gonna do a front squat, it's gonna be a little bit less. I'm gonna do a back squat, it's gonna be a little bit less. Now I'm gonna do a low bar back squat, it's gonna be even more of a hinge, and it's gonna be even less. Now I'm gonna go into a trap bar deadlift. The deadlift, but it's very quad dominant as well as hip dominant. And so now I'm kind of in between on this continuum between squat and deadlift. Now I'm gonna go into a sumo deadlift, right? Sumo, yes, I'm hinging, but depending on that person's torso length, depending on their quad length, they may be somewhere here within that continuum. And then eventually I'm gonna go to do a stiff leg RDL where I completely fold 
over. So that continuum is just important to note based on the skeletal structure of the pelvis and the hip joints itself, somebody's femur length and their body's ability to move through those joints. Also their body, body's ability to stabilize their pelvis, right? Certain things you can't. The thing with squats, Again, we said most of the quad is still going to be trained the same regardless because it's going to be activated across the board. Very similar to the pec. We'll get into that when we do upper body. And it's just the nature of how much the musculature is and where it is and what it's attached to and what it's doing. But ultimately, a good squat, the key is not how much they lean forward. Like a lot of times people are like, you need to be more, up, more upright, more upright. Like, I don't care. What I care about is that your shin angle and your torso angle should match. They should be fairly even as we are going through that movement pattern. So if that means somebody needs to rotate their feet out more and externally rotate, then allow them to do so, right? We want to keep those joints as stacked as possible, but we want our shin angle and our torso angle to match. That is how a squat ultimately is going to present the safest from a stability point of that lower lumbar spine and position of the knees, okay? Okay. Hip flexors. So again, you've got nine. So what's funny is you're like, well, what extends, what 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 flexes the hip? You got your rect fam, you got your sartorius, you got your pectineus, like the little muscle that comes across here. You got your adductor brevis, which comes all the way down here on this side. You've got your, your psoas minor, major. You got your glute med, you got your glute major, minor, right? So it's a ton of things that help you flex the hip. And it's none of them you wouldn't even think about being like actual hip flexors because like it's your rec fam, like it's your main one. So oftentimes when people are really talking about hip flexors, they're talking about the psoas um, more than anything else. And, and the reason is you can see that it attaches to that lesser trochanter, like I was mentioning. So it's slightly behind on that femur um, and it comes all the way around and it's big and it's meaty and it's attached to all of these vertebrae, right? So all of those aspects of the lumbar vertebrae. So think about just how important this is in stabilizing your spine. It's crucial. So if you want to be able to hinge and feel your hamstrings, your psoas better be doing what it's meant to be doing, right? If you want to have position rotation of your pelvis, your pelvis really doesn't move that much as far as rotation, but while you're sprinting and not just like have major issues, yeah, your psoas better be working, right? It better be, it's always working. It better be fully functioning to the ability that we need it to. Fully functioning means to stabilize, right? function. So <clears throat> that's why it is such an important player. And I just feel like this is such a visual that it's really helpful. So oftentimes we just need to be able to bring that knee up and hold, isolate, hold, get that to feel those hip flexors right through this aspect of the position. We all also might need to plank. We may need to slide plank so we can feel all of this happening through, right? You get your iliacus, which comes up and attaches, which is also key to, to kind of take a look at, right? So it's a major player in your frontal plane movements, which is why I was saying like when you're running, so that deviation of side to side, it's a huge player here, right? So if we do a single arm plank, we're actually training some psoas, right? We lift the leg up, we're training some psoas from a plank position, okay? Let's get into some adductors. All right, so pectineus is one of the ones I was talking about, right? Attaches here, comes right across. So oftentimes people have groin issues, right? This is what's happening. These are just because oftentimes they have a pretty wide angle um, between where their hips are. And so that is having to do a lot to stabilize or they have really long femurs. And so again, it's having to do a lot of work to stabilize the pelvis. And so if the psoas isn't doing enough, if the hamstrings aren't doing enough, if um, the lats aren't doing enough, right? Oftentimes we can end up with a strain or a tear of the groin, which is oftentimes the pectineus um, or pectineus. <laughs> oh, I say pectineus, but, um, but ultimately like that's why this is so important to still be able to train from a functional stability standpoint, uh, not just like hip abduction. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Bringing that leg back in. You think of every adductor, um, it is a huge player in athletics, right? You need to be able to slide left to left. You need to be able to slide right to right. You have a side left to right and right to left. So that's why it's absolutely critical with controlling hip abduction. So that hip wants to go out, it's going to control it so that you're not going to just keep going out and have any type of issues. When you step and it wants to deviate and slide all the way around, it is doing a major job to control the pelvis so that you don't have that knee continue to go sideways. And then you're like, whoops, there goes my meniscus, 
right? And that's why you have so many different insertion points here, which is kind of interesting, including the gracialis, which comes all the way down, so from your ischial tuberosity, all the way down to the other side of the condyle of the knee, right? Absolutely critical here. So it's a major player in all those frontal plane rotation and anti-rotational movements, which is why we really need to train it mostly from a functional stability standpoint more than anything else um, to, to make sure that we aren't going to continue going in motion. That brings me to the last kind of piece here, which is this Q angle. So again, remember at the very beginning when I was like, is it a male or a female? I just kind of call him male, right? Say he's Larry. Now, everybody's uh, pelvic structure is going to be different, okay? So typically, 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 females have a wider hip base structure, right? They, it's to, to be able to birth some babies, okay? And so therefore they're gonna present with a wider Q angle. So that Q angle is, is really just the difference in angle between the medial aspect of the knee and the external aspect of the hip, right? It's this aspect here that creates an angle and the more straight up and down, the less of a Q angle you're going to have. Now this may look like valgus collapse, right? It's like those knees are collapsing in and then therefore it's just externally rotate the feet. That, not necessarily, right? Because these joints could be still very well stacked, especially when we put them into position to, to best activate and to best function. But it's just still important to note, right? That for some people, they just need to externally rotate a little bit more or a little less than others in order to find a position that is doable for them to be able to move through space with what we are trying to achieve. It also usually means that when we look at the most elite level sprinters, they have a pretty narrow Q angle. They have very narrow hips. So their propulsion is all gonna be forward, right? And so they aren't gonna have as much of this deviation within frontal plane. The wider the hips, uh, the skeletal structure, it's gonna indicate a different function, which is why those types of people, right? With, with, can do a powerlifting meet, just lock into place and be able to rip and do extremely well. So it can actually be important to kind of note where somebody's Q angle is with where I wanna program them. Do I want them to go into a nice sumo position that could be great. Do I want them to be a sprinter? Sweet. They've got this Q angle. This could be really good. We can train this. And it's why when you look at sports, they're very sagittal plane dominant. And I'm going to say sport loosely, um, but CrossFit, right? CrossFit competitors, you look at a lot of their, even their female competitors, and they've got narrow hips, a lot of sprinters, like 100 meter, 200 meter, et cetera, narrow hips. Now it doesn't mean that they don't have like very, very strong glutes, like um, but it's, it's a lot of those movements just simply happen within the sagittal plane for those athletes that are doing CrossFit, like even from their, their pull-ups and their work, even if they're kipping and such, right? All the way down, everything is push press. That is, you know, pull-ups, it is squats, it is deadlifts, it is cleans. Everything is in the sagittal plane that is happening for them. And so the more narrow the Q angle, the more explosive power and strength that they're going to have because those joints are going to be easier to stack within those positions and it's going to achieve the aspect that they're looking for, right? Now, it's, they're going to achieve heavier, bigger numbers like if they have a slightly wider Q angle, which is why when you look at strongman, right? Yes, a lot of the moves can be similar, but because they're taking different loads and they're moving and rotating and still doing those things, they need a bigger, wider Q angle to be able to accomplish their sport, right? Um, you look at hockey players, right? A lot of times hockey players have wider hips. You look at linemen, linemen have wider hips. They need to be able to take force rather than not just exert force, right? And they need so a different Q angle. So the sport can play a huge role, which is then gonna determine what that glute max is going to be like. So glute max, major hip extender, right? It's just important to note that its job is to control the hip, stabilize the pelvis, just like all of these other ones that are around there very similar to the shoulder, right? Ball and socket, ball and socket. You just have so many more things that are down there. It originates from the ilium, if you were to look here, and the postural aspect of the coccyx and the sacrum. So it's attaching all to the backside and coming across, right? Then you've got your glute med right up here, which we'll see on the next slide. And they all then go down and insert into the IT band and the tuberosity of the femur. So it's along that greater tra trochanter that we were talking about. So oftentimes people say like, oh, I've got IT band issues, I've got TFL issues you might have some challenges there. Oftentimes we just need to strength, train the glutes a little bit more or get them to function a little bit more through stabilization so that the IT band is not being yanked on and trying to be the stabilizer of the hip itself, right? And so sometimes this is where nobody has sleepy glutes, but we might need to just make the glutes stronger and make them do what they actually do. The beauty of the glute is it's triplanar movement, like it uh, muscle, it can move into all of these different ranges. Cause again, it can extend the hip, abduct the hip, externally rotate the hip. It can do a lot, which is beautiful, right? All right, so last little thing here is your glute med, right? It's this tiny little guy on the side. Your glute med 
and pay attention your medial delt very similar because they're attaching right basically ball and socket on and pulling it so that it can a b duct so you have two different aspects right of your hip with your glute med same thing with your, your uh delt give three main parts but if we're looking at the hip you've got this front part so this is the look at this muscle action anterior okay it is going to a b duct and internally rotate what does that look like a b duct is going to kick out and it's going to internally rotate you can't see my foot can you it's going to internally rotate. you still can't because you see my desk failure so it's going to internally rotate it's going to rotate in okay that's what the anterior aspect of this this is going to be here now the posterior aspect of it is going to still a b duct still pull it out but because of the orientation of the fibers with how that like fan teardrop fan comes down it's going to externally rotate. So this is the beauty of the glute mean and why it is so important and we give it so much attention is because it need, it, it's gonna be able to bring that leg out into everything that we do. So it brings it out so that we can actually carry gait cycle. It internally rotates so we can fix our propulsion forward and our control our hips as we you know decelerate. It does so much here. So oftentimes people like give all these like mini band workouts, right? I'm gonna mini band, I'm gonna build my glute mean. Look. Like it is teaching the action of the muscle. That is good, right? I get it. You are creating some strength training, but the main, more than anything else, function of the glute med is to laterally stabilize the hip. It is the rotator cuff of the hip. It is essential to make sure you don't fall when taking a step off sideways and your hip wants to keep going. It doesn't want you to keep going. <laughs> It's, it's going to try and keep you from not continuing to go, right? So that your hip doesn't go, right? And so it is really important to train single leg and split stance to really get the function of the glute med. We will most often train with mini bands to feel what that is, to create just a mind muscle connection, right? Proprioceptive awareness of the glute med to get a burn. I really feel those on. Cool, let's start making those stronger even though it's more of just to get the simulation of mind muscle connection. It still could just de definitely be needed to strengthen and to help. But then when we go in and we do a split squat, now our body is a little bit more ready to do so. It is ready and prepared to be able to function the way we need to so that we can train what it, we really are after with it. Um, more than anything else, right? So it, it's just noting that that's what we are trying to do with that, all right? So I know I dumped a lot on you. Hopefully you stuck with me, right? And uh, if you have any questions, you know how to find me and looking forward to seeing you on the next recording.